We have the largest X flare of the solar cycle yet, an active region shooting blanks, and a filament eruption along with fast solar wind is going to save the day with a chance for aurora. Those stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash SWEN. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week is picking up in a big way, and there's some surprises. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we've been watching the far side of the sun over the past week or so for big eruptions. Boom! Just like that one right there, because there's a lot of active regions rotating into Earth view over the next few days that from the far side that are big flare players. In fact, region 3590 was one of those, and it has not disappointed, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. Meanwhile, we've been looking at this coronal hole. That's going to be rotating into the Earth strike zone here over the next couple days and giving us some fast solar wind. On top of that, we've got this filament right here. This filament back on the 21st or, or 22nd erupted. Whoosh, you can see it right there. There's a beautiful picture of it from the SUVI spacecraft. Wham, like that. Now, this filament, when we take a look in coronagraphs, you can see it actually created a partial halo. You see that? So that means that this, this uh, structure is actually part Earth directed. It looks like it's going to give us a glancing blow, likely sometime on the 25th. We'll talk more about that when we turn to prediction models. But that is not the only story. We've got a lot more going on on the sun. Meanwhile, as we take look a back look at a look at region 3590, this region started off kind of quietly, but then it began to start evolving in such a way that got us really excited. In fact, as we take a look at the magnetic complexity of this region, Region over the last few days. It started out kind of quietly, but then if you watch this reddish region here kind of begin to pinch this blue region in like this, you will see a really strong magnetic interface beginning to build right in here. This is an unstable region, and this is when we started getting big solar flares from this region. In fact, we started also seeing a lot of magnetic movement in this area, and there's some new spots kind of emerging in here. So we've been getting a lot of, you can see it all all right in through here as well, the movement plus all of this pinching. This is what has been driving a lot of the big solar flares that we've been seeing. In fact, starting around the 21st, late on the 21st, we got a big flare. This was an M or an X 1.9 flare at an R3 level radio blackout. This was over the, the Pacific. In fact, the Pacific is the, keeps getting hammered by these big X class flares. This had a big radio burst up to about eight uh, gigahertz. On top of that, uh, just not even 12 hours later, we get hit again by another flare. This was an X uh, 1.7 flare, again, an R3 level radio blackout, this time not quite over uh, uh, Australia and the, and the Asian Pacific, but uh, still major uh, intensity when it comes to radio blackouts. Then, as we move into the 22nd, we get the largest flare of this solar cycle. You can see it right here. Bam! Right there. This is an X 6.37 flare. And this particular solar flare had a radio burst up to almost 14 gigahertz. That's crazy high in terms of, especially in the KU band, we might have even had a little bit of interference with the Odyssey mission trying to land its, its lander there. Hopefully it wasn't too much of a problem, but it did cause an R3 level radio blackout. We actually lost some data for a while. Then we caught the R3 blackout in progress on our DRAP model. You can see it again over, over the Pacific and the radio, if I back up just a smidge here, you can actually see this. Look at the radio contacts prior Prior to the solar flare hitting, you can actually see lots of yellow in here. Now watch when that flare hits. Look at all the attenuation in the Pacific. Where did the lines go? All the radio contacts are gone. So this was a big issue uh, on the 22nd, late on the 22nd, as this solar flare occurred. And 
The funny thing is that none of these solar flares have fired off any big solar storms. So despite the fact that we've had one, two, three big X-class flares, no solar storms, this region is firing blanks. And that means Aurora photographers, you are out of luck right now when it comes to this region. In fact, as it continues rotating across the disk, it's going to take probably another seven days. We could see a few more big solar flares from this region, but likely we're not going to get any Earth-directed solar storms. So thankfully, we do have the fast solar wind from this region, as well as that filament eruption, because that's going to save the day and at least give us a little bit of Aurora at high latitudes. Now, as we switch to our uh, simulated far side sun, this, because we can no longer use stereo A imagery because stereo is looking at the same side of the sun as we are, we need to switch to uh, SDO, AIA, AIA, and HMI imagery from about two weeks ago to get an idea of what is lurking on the sun's far side. So when we take a look at these regions, we had region 3575. This was a big flare player uh, about two, two and a little more than two weeks ago. Plus, we had a whole host of different regions, and we had some big regions in 3576 and 3578 as well. As we take a look at our HMI helioseismology far-sighted viewer, you can see these regions here as they looked two weeks ago uh, on the uh, Earth-facing sun. But as we take a look in the yellow, this is the far side of the sun. You can see all the dark regions these are where the big solar or the big active regions are are still growing or at least remaining active and so you can see as they moved into the sun's far side definitely region 35 75 64 and 73 this is region 3590 as you can see that one's already entered earth view these are just beginning to enter earth view but also look at regions 35 76 and 35 78 so we do have more regions that are going to be rotating into earth view these regions are still alive although Right now, it looks like they're reasonably quiescent. They may have done all their business on the far side, and so they've not left much uh, in the way of rotating back into Earth view. Their life may be pretty much over. We'll have to see. But it sure looks like these regions are still alive, and that means, as you can see them rotating here into, into Earth view, whoops, keep going. You can see them rotating in, into Earth view two weeks ago. They were definitely very active. So these are going to be the regions to watch. They're going to be entering Earth Earth view in about maybe five days, maybe five to seven days. So we're going to have to wait and see if they give us any big Earth-directed solar storms to make up for the solar storm fizzle that is 3590. Now, returning to that partially Earth-directed solar storm, we switch to our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now, this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity, and you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. Now, as we set this solar storm model in motion, you'll see that solar storm being launched mainly to the west of Earth, but it does look like there's going to be a little bit of a, the flank of this structure hitting Earth right about uh, midday on the 25th. Uh, if we take a look at the at the NASA model, they look they say that the storm should hit a little bit earlier than that, but I think NOAA's got a pretty good read on this one. It's not going to be a super strong impact, but it could bring Aurora down to uh, high latitudes, possibly down into mid latitudes as well. And we've got a weak uh, bit of fast solar wind. You can actually see the fast solar wind here. It's not a very strong uh, fast solar wind because the, the hole, the coronal hole is pretty small, but it may be just enough to give us a little bit of enhancement of this solar storm. So Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could de definitely get a show at mid latitudes. Well, maybe if you're dedicated, you could chase. Now, switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are expecting that partially Earth-directed solar storm to hit us right about the 25th, let's say about midday on the 25th, followed by some fast solar wind. So at high latitudes, NOAA is expecting major storm conditions. In fact, we have about a 35% chance of a major to a severe storm at high latitudes. We might even have a bit of storming on the 24th if the storm arrives early, but likely if 20 
25th is going to be when we're going to be looking for aurora at high latitudes and then that will linger in through the 26th with that fast solar wind but things will then settle down after that and right now it doesn't look like we have any big uh contenders for new solar storm launches so likely this can this uh, forecast is going to remain pretty much the same now at mid latitudes well we're only expecting active conditions once this solar storm hits uh, but we have about a 10 percent chance of a minor storm again we're not expecting all that much from this solar storm but if you're a dedicated aurora chaser it might be worth a look and then things will linger a little bit into the 26th before settling down, but by Tuesday and Wednesday of next week, things should be looking pretty good. Now, as we switch to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, well, we are sitting at about 175 or so, maybe a little bit higher than that as the week progresses with more active regions rotating into Earth view. The main player, of course, is region 3590. That is the big X flare player, but we do have a couple others that are going to be rotating into view. And so we've got moderate noise on the bands right now, and this is on the dayside radio bands. Expect that to continue uh, easily over the rest of this week. NOAA is giving us about a 60% chance of an R1 to R2 radio blackout. That's an M-class flare and even a 30% chance for X-class flares at the R3 uh, level radio blackout over the rest of this week. So you aviators definitely pay attention to those ICAO advisories. Know that radio blackouts are, are on the menu and will continue to be easily for this this week and possibly the next before things begin to kind of settle down a little bit. Now, as we switch to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, we are sitting at the D1 normal range right now. Uh, this is for you uh, aviators at flight level 360. It is a little bit elevated, but likely not enough to cause much issue when it comes to H, uh, HF uh, radio communications. This is also the S0 level. It's really not elevated all that much. And NOAA's giving us about a 10% chance of an S1 to S2 level radiation storm, mainly because of region 3590. And this risk will likely increase a little bit as we uh, move to, to the about midweek uh, next week simply because that region's going to be rotating to the west limb. But we're right now thinking everything's going to stay pretty much in the green. Even with these big radio blackouts, we're not expecting uh, big uh, uh, radiation storms with this one. So you're all in the clear, especially if you're frequent flyers. So the space weather this week has gotten very exciting. We have region 3590 that is firing these big X-class flares, including the largest X flare of this solar cycle yet. And believe it or not, it is still firing blanks when it comes to big solar storms. So just because you get big X flares does not mean you're gonna have big Earth-directed solar storms. So aurora photographers, well, you're gonna have to deal with getting that little filament eruption that's only partly Earth-directed and some fast solar wind to try to catch some aurora of views here over this week, especially at high latitudes. Now you mid-latitude aurora photographers, well, only if you're dedicated should you go out there and chase, but because it's been kind of a dry spell, it might be worth a look. Now on top of this, we do have those R3 level radio blackouts that are still ongoing, and no, they did not cause the AT&T outage. Big radio bursts like this are not going to cause uh, cell phone towers to, to have major issues, so don't worry about it, especially if you're on the night side you don't even notice solar flares when you're on the night side so we can relax about that that was just a lot of media hype for no reason but the amateur radio operators and emergency responders you're definitely dealing with some big radio blackouts aviation industry is also dealing with some big radio blackouts and you're going to continue to deal with that and believe it or not even some satellite outages like starlink things like that may be in intermittently been being uh, caused problems because the radio bursts are so high with this particular region, and that might continue. We might see a little bit of a break from 3590 because right now it looks like it's not growing. It's kind of stabilized just a little bit, but you never know, especially as this region rotates to the west limb, things could start picking up again. So just be aware, and if you're an aviator, be sure to check those ICAO advisories often. And now you GPS users, well, my goodness, we these radio blackouts do mean you too. <laughs> so if you're anywhere near dawn or dusk, definitely 
definitely stay vigilant and be careful. Uh, likely won't have to worry about the aurora issues uh, unless you're flying near aurora. That can cause you a bit of GPS reception. But on the day side, be, be extra vigilant and extra careful because of these radio blackouts easily over the rest of this week. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.